Let's first review the general equations of motion for planar motion that we studied previously. For an object subjected to multiple forces and couple moments within the established coordinate system, it undergoes the general plane motion, which is a combination of translations within this plane and rotation about an axis that is perpendicular to this plane. From the free body diagram, we can summarize all the external forces acting on this object, and we can summarize the moment with respect to an arbitrary point P, and write a set of equations of motion. Normally, the resultant force along the x direction equals to m, the mass of the object, times agx, the linear acceleration along the x direction of the gravitational center of this um, object resultant force along the y direction, similarly, equals to magy. Of course, if you choose a different set of coordinate system, for example, the normal or tangential coordinates, you can write these two equations differently with respect to the normal and tangential coordinates. The last equation, the resultant moment, summarized about any arbitrary point equals to mkp, which is the total kinetic moment about point P. And this total kinetic moment about point P is calculated this way by simply treating magx, magy as inertia forces and calculate their moment about point P and also treating ig alpha as a free couple moment. These are the equations of motion for planar motion in the most general form. And since we can summarize the resultant moment about any arbitrary point P, for convenience, we can summarize the resultant moment about the gravitational center point G of this object, and the third equation becomes the resultant moment summarized about point G simply equals to Ig alpha. Ig, once again, is the mass moment of inertia of this object with respect to an axis that passes through its gravitational center point G, and is perpendicular to the xy plane. Based on the equations of motion for general plane motion, now let's derive the equations of motion for the special case, rotation about a fixed axis. Like in this case, the object is pinned at point O, therefore it is only allowed to rotate about an axis that is perpendicular to this plane that passes through point O. Let me remind you again, for general plane motion, the rotation is always about an axis that is perpendicular to this plane. Again, let's start with drawing the free body diagram and the kinetic diagram of this object. Here, when we remove the pin support at point O, we need to add the support reaction force. Now, we can certainly apply the equations of motion for general plane motion as we learned earlier. However, since this is rotation about a fixed axis, and also we learned about the kinematics for rotation, we know that point G, the gravitational center, as well as any other point on this object, all follow a circular path in their motion. Therefore, it is more convenient to set up the normal and the tangential coordinate system originated at the gravitational center point G, and instead of summarizing the forces along the x and y direction, now we summarize the forces along the normal and tangential direction. As you can see, the linear acceleration of point G, AG, is also resolved in the normal and the tangential directions now. And again, from the kinematics of rotation, we learned that the linear acceleration along the normal direction, AN equals to omega squared R, omega is the angular velocity of this object, at, the tangential acceleration, equals to alpha r, alpha is the angular acceleration of this object, and r is the radius from the axis of rotation to our point, point g in this case. Therefore, now we can rewrite this set of equations this way, and notice that the last equation is still the same. The resultant moment summarized about an arbitrary point P equals to the total kinetic moment summarized about the same point P 
In this case, it's calculated this way by treating MAGT and MAGN as if they are inertial forces and calculate their moment about point P through the moment arms and then treating IG alpha as if it's a free couple moment. Once again, since we can summarize the resultant moment about any arbitrary point, why don't we summarize that about point G, the gravitational center? And for the third equation, the resultant moment about the gravitational center point G simply equals to IG alpha. We can also summarize the resultant moment about point O, the center of rotation, and that equals to the total kinetic moment about point O. And how do we calculate that? For this inertia force, it passes through point O, therefore it will not have moment about point O. For this inertia force, its moment arm about point O is always a constant RG, therefore the total kinetic moment about point O equals to MAGT times its moment arm RG, but don't forget AGT is alpha RG and then plus IG alpha. Therefore, it becomes this, and within the parentheses, we know that according to the parallel axis theorem, this equals to IO. IO is the mass moment of inertia of this object with respect to the axis of rotation passing through point O. Therefore, the third equation simply becomes the resultant moment about point O equals to IO alpha. Keep in mind, this equation only applies when point O is the center of rotation. Let's look at this example. We have an object that is pinned at a point O and it's rotating because of the external couple moment of 100 Newton meter. This object has a mass of 50 kilogram and the radius of gyration about its gravitational center is 0.4 meter. And if at this instant, the object is rotating with an angular velocity of 6 radian per second, and we need to determine the support reactions at point O, as well as the angular acceleration of this object at this instant. Again, we start with drawing the free body diagram of this object. We remove the pin support at point O, and since we're going to set up our coordinate system to be normal and tangential, we resolve the support force at point O into normal and tangential components as well. And we draw the kinetic diagram of this object showing the linear acceleration again resolved into normal and tangential directions at the gravitational center point G as well as IG alpha. Now we are ready to write the equations of motion. First, we have the resultant force along the normal direction, which includes the unknown ON force and the normal component of the weight force, and that equals to m times the linear acceleration along the normal direction, which is omega squared rg. Omega is the angular velocity of the object, 6 radian per second. Rg is the distance from point G to point O, the center of rotation, which is 0.6 meter. So as you can see in this equation, we only have one unknown, which is ON, and that can be solved. Next, we write the resultant force along the tangential direction, which includes the unknown force OT and the tangential component of the weight force. And that equals to mass times the linear acceleration along the tangential direction, alpha RG. M is known, RG is known, so the right-hand side becomes 30 alpha. In this equation, we have two unknowns, OT and alpha, so we cannot solve for either one of them at this point. We need the third equation, which is a resultant moment equation. We can summarize the moment about any arbitrary point, but for convenience, we're going to summarize it about point O, because this way, the two unknown forces, OT and ON, both have lines of action passing through point O, so they do not have moment about point O. This only includes the 100 Newton meter applied couple moment and the moment caused by the weight force about point O. As you can see, this approach has the convenience that we eliminate both unknowns in this equation. 
And on the right hand side, we have IO alpha. Alpha is our unknown, the angular acceleration, and IO is the mass moment of inertia about 0.0, the center of rotation. And IO can be calculated from IG through the parallel axis theorem. And IG can be determined from the radius of gyration KG. And all of these are known, so it reduces to 26 alpha. As you can see, in the third equation, we only have one unknown, which is alpha. And alpha can be solved. And we can substitute this result in the second equation and solve for the remaining unknown, OT. This completes this problem, but we can try an alternative approach. Let's see what happens if we choose not to summarize the moment about point O, the center of rotation, but about point G, the center of gravity. In this case, the weight force does not have moment about point G. However, the unknown force OT does. And this equals to simply IG alpha. IG is the mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity point G. And IG can be determined through the radius of gyration mkg squared. So as you can see, in this equation, we have two unknowns, OT and alpha. We cannot easily solve for either one of them, but we do have another equation, the resultant force along the tangential direction that we wrote previously. So here we have two equations, two unknowns. We can solve for both unknowns simultaneously, and we get the same results as the previous approach. So it is up to you to decide what is the approach that you prefer. Let's look at this example. We have a composite pendulum that is made of a uniform slender rod and a uniform disc. And it is pinned at a point O. And initially, it is at this horizontal position. And then it is released from rest. And due to its weight, it starts rotating about point O. And we need to determine its angular velocity, angular acceleration, as well as the support reaction at point O when angle theta is 60 degree. Since this problem involves rotation of a rigid body, inevitably we need to determine the mass moment of inertia of this object. And if you recall from one of the previous videos, we already did that. Therefore, we know that the gravitational center of this object is located at 0.84 meter from point O. And we also know that the radius of gyration of this object with respect to point G, its gravitational center, is 0.5 meter. Once again, we start with the free body diagram of this pendulum. We set up the coordinate system, normal and tangential coordinate system originated at point G, the gravitational center. And this object is only subjected to the reaction force at point O resolved into normal and tangential components, as well as its own weight. And that can be resolved into normal and tangential components as well, following trigonometry. And then we draw the kinetic diagram showing all the motions. Here, notice that because we know that this pendulum is rotating clockwise, therefore, we can draw our angular acceleration alpha to be clockwise as well. And now we are ready to write our equations of motion. First, resultant force along the normal direction equals to ON minus the normal component of the weight. And that equals to M times AGN. And AGN, the normal linear acceleration of the gravitational center, is omega squared times RG. Then the resultant force along the tangential direction equals to OT plus the tangential component of the weight. And that equals to the mass times the tangential linear acceleration, which is alpha RG. And lastly, for the resultant moment equation, we have several options. But again, we want to summarize the moment about point O since our unknowns ON and OT both pass through point O, they do not have moment about point O. Therefore, they do not show up in our third equation. Therefore, in our third equation, the only unknown is alpha. 
So I owe the mass moment of inertia about 0, 0.0 equals to Ig, which is m kg squared from the radius of gyration, plus m rg squared. Rg, again, is the perpendicular distance between the two parallel axes. So again, we're calculating I owe according to the parallel axis theorem. Substitute in the known parameters. And from here, we can solve for alpha to be 8.62 cosine theta when theta equals to 60 degree, alpha is 4.31 radian per second squared. So that is the angular acceleration of this pendulum. But what about the angular velocity? How do we get that? Since this is rotation about a fixed axis, and we already learned the kinematics for rotation about a fixed axis, therefore we can write this kinematic equation that omega d omega equals to alpha d theta. Therefore, omega can be calculated through integration. When theta equals to 60 degree, omega, the linear velocity, is 3.86 radian per second. Now we know both the linear velocity and acceleration at theta equals to 60 degree. We can substitute them in into the first equation to calculate On, the normal reaction force, and OT, the tangential reaction force. And this completes this problem.